Cube, Silicon Angle's cutting edge internet TV show where we're covering all the latest and greatest in technology. Today we're in San Francisco at the first Node Summit, a, an, an event dedicated to Node.js. And I'm joined today by the guy who literally wrote the book on Node, uh, Tom Hughes Croucher, the author of the forthcoming Up and Running with Node for, from O'Reilly. And also here with John Furrier, the co-founder or founder of uh, Silicon Angle. Welcome to the Cube. Well, what do you think? You You're guys? in the queue. We're relaxing. Mm -hmm. So you wrote the book. I wrote the book. Uh, don't write a book. I don't recommend it. <laughs> it's good that it's done. Yeah, yeah. It's good for speaking gigs, you know. You get the book <laughs> out there. No, but seriously, no, it's been such a huge success. Um, just recently, just rising really to the top of people's minds and, and hearts of developers. What's the phenomenon about why why so fast? I think it's been really interesting. I mean, I, I spent the last two years uh, traveling the world talking about Node uh, for both Yahoo and then for Joint, um, who of course sponsor Node, and just seeing the kind of the shift of the developer mindset. Um, it, Ruby's been really popular. People have built a lot of great things with Rails, but it's no longer acceptable to have a slow app. Everybody wants thousands of users. Everybody wants um, real time, and you know that's the reason that people are, are shifting to Node because they need that high performance. You know, and and they need to be able to present a company that that can hey scale to ten thousand users, a hundred thousand users, a million users. You know, and if you look at the kind of uh, the kind of startups um, that are really doing stuff with Node, like Voxer, you know, they have millions of users making phone calls, you know, using the system, and it's like that's pretty incredible. So yeah, I'm really I'm really uh, amazed at the continued growth. So let's talk about that mindset. So this is something that people are trying to get their heads around outside of the community. Uh, the mindset, obviously, with I/O, we were, we were talking uh, earlier with with Matt about uh, you know boxers getting that low latency number down mm -hmm. down to the bone as fast as they can. They're pushing the envelope on that. But it, talk about the mindset. What is that mindset? Is it all about just thinking differently around coding? Is it around more architecture? Is it systems programming, all of the above, multiple languages? What is that mindset that's different from where it was? I think primarily it's the architecture, and I think it's this, there's this fundamental assumption. Um, a lot of the architectures that we have have been this legacy that's come from like the, the batch computing days, like literally punch cards, where um, the, the entire architectures we've been using to build internet applications are based on these multi-user mainframes where you know the CPU used to be sliced between the different programs for each user, and, and we no longer have that problem. We now have this problem where we build um, applications that facilitate communication. And it turns out that the networking piece is the hardest piece. And it can't get any better because even when we hit fiber, fiber is still constrained by the speed of light. We can't go faster than the speed of light. So at some point, you know, even if everybody has fiber in everybody's homes, it's still going to take, um, you know, whatever it is, 50 milliseconds to get from here to Hong Kong. We can't make that faster. And that constraint is this real constraint that everybody's been ignoring up till now. And, and Node really has made it easy for people to, to deal with that constraint, to take that thing and, and kind of create an architecture where you know, anybody can code in a way which, which doesn't care about this network I.O. problem. So it gives the developer more back-end like capabilities with that constraint and uh, as benefits, it increases their range of, of capabilities. Uh, Matt called, uh, he had a nice line in our last interview just now, was it, he treats HTTP like a first-class citizen. Right, exactly. Uh, talk about that, that role. I mean, that's a protocol that's obviously standard. Talk about why that's now a first-class citizen. Well, and I think this is, um, I, I mean, again, like many, many languages have this kind of historic uh, culture where they, they've picked up a bunch of stuff. Java, JavaScript didn't have um, any real success on the server um, until, until Node came along. I mean, some people were using it for a few things, but you went to the JavaScript conferences and it was a few people doing a few things. With Node, we now have this large body of people that have suddenly embraced uh, a new uh, way of doing this coding where it's noticed specifically been designed to serve websites. It's been specifically designed to do internet applications. So it's not just taking the, um, uh, you know, JavaScript as a language. It's saying, hey, we want JavaScript to do this thing really well. And, and Node's, you know, sometimes criticized because it doesn't do some specific general purpose application that Java or something else does better. We don't care. 
the thing that we're really interested in is this large problem that lots of people use the internet and lots of people use the web. And if we can do that one thing really, really well, then we're going to you know, save or make a lot of people a lot of money. And, and create a lot of good things in the world. Yeah, so it's not so it's so it's diverse devices and connections. Yeah. And so you guys just standardize on that HTTP and the server capabilities. Right. Um, and, and I think this is kind of you can see that in something like uh, like LinkedIn. LinkedIn um, switched uh, their mobile services to using Node, and that had a, an extremely dramatic impact because the uh, the connections that mobile phones have that cell phones have is so poor. So in that context, switching that context has a much higher benefit than a different context, such as service-to-server communication. Are we really talking about the mobile web here? I mean, all the key themes and use cases seem to be high leg on mobile. I think, I think mobile's a, a really huge use case. Um, there were some really interesting statistics I saw um, recently that, that talked about the sort of the shift between the amount of users that have internet uh, through their cell phone device versus internet through their, um, through their broadband device. Um, and that's shifting in the US. It's definitely shifting in the emerging markets. So I think there's increasingly, there's, that's going to become an important topic where you know, most users have, um, especially in, in, in the, uh, the areas where people don't have internet, so um, maybe less affluent backgrounds, they still have mobile internet, even if they don't have broadband wide internet at home. And that brings up the whole um, mutually exclusive argument. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm on a mobile device, but also I might have three or four other connections going on at the same time, and the data needs to manage that. So how do, does that address well in Node, and, how, and we were just talking with Voxer about that, that they got to save all the messages, someone's on a mobile phone, they also want to move over to the browser. Sure. Um, what's the back-end data flow look like? So, I mean, Node doesn't solve all problems of scale, but again, I mean, this is a key part of internet applications, is that um, a lot of what we do now is we shuffle data around. So, um, in general, if you think of an application like Google as, as a sort of the canonical web application, if I typed in a, in a search query, you know, for cats or something, and then Google went out and searched every web page for cats in real time, it would take a month then to go through all of those web pages. So instead, they compute a search index, and they can return me a, uh, a result in a matter of seconds. All of that's about shuffling data back and forth. It's, it's not about um, the actual computation anymore for the user. It's about how do we go and find the information that we've already have? How do we go and find the information that's, uh, that's specific and is, um, is the information that the user wants. So it's stored somewhere, and it's how do we route to that information? So that's the real question. That's the real, um, the real problem that we're trying to solve for these, these sort of current up-to-date internet apps. Talk about the, uh, the impact. Let's stay on that mobile thread, because I think that really mm -hmm. is a huge, and, and everyone now is shifting to mobile, so it's not just about web on the browser anymore. It's actually you've got to have that device access point uh, connected. Um, obviously, it's a really a two-horse race with Apple and Android. Where are these guys weighing in on this? And we saw a great demo from Brass Monkey about their gaming, very cool app, um, this browser, doesn't work with Apple TV. Mm -hmm. So there's issues, Apple, you know, not known for their JavaScript support, uh, you know, really well. I mean, they're always, you know, dicking around with standards and want to control it. What does that mean? I mean, is it going to, LinkedIn is, is it a bottleneck? Is it a problem, not a problem? And uh, Android a little bit more open, less mature than Apple, but open? Well, I think, this, what's I think your views on all that? What we can see is that um, clearly um, the, the sort of the cloud services are playing an increasingly large role in, um, in mobile apps. So for example, Siri, as, a, as a, obviously a, a, an Apple product, wouldn't be possible without cloud. Siri is simply, you know, it has some very limited on-device capabilities, but really in order to do any kind of significant functionality, Siri relies entirely on cloud services. So um, the, the idea of a cell phone that's connected to the cloud is becoming this increasingly important topic where, um, I mean, for example, the LinkedIn app, of course, you know, we know uses Node, but um, it relies heavily on these APIs. So the data on the device itself is extremely limited, and it's then going to the cloud to, to do that. So we need to do that in a really efficient, scalable, effective way to support all of the users, support all of the different devices. And that's where Node really comes in. And I think, um, I mean, there's a, there's a company that I'm advising called WebMobi, and the, um, the idea is to build a platform which is sort of a, you know, a mashing up phone gap apps plus cloud APIs. And, and this, is, this is the kind of space where we're looking to um, make it easy for people to um, take an API 
um, and take those kind of cloud services that people rely on and then have that replicated into the device. Like how do you, you know, how do you um, pair those things together? And these are where applications are going, where we rely on the big data, the big compute, the big um, services that we put into clouds like Joint and Amazon and Rackspace and all of those places where the server farms are doing all the processing but then the representation to the user is happening on the device that they, that they want. And the actual functionality of, um, the actual functionality you can keep on the device is entirely dependent on this data that we're pulling in from these cloud services. So this, this is the mindset yeah. that you're talking about. This notion that, hey, let's relook at the architecture, leverage the fact that we have more powerful devices at the edge. I don't want to call them fat clients because they're really thin, right. but they're powerful and the CPU's getting better sure. and stronger, the network's the bottleneck. Is that, is that correct what well, you're saying? Well, I think this is the thing. So if I, if I this is my phone, um, I have an iPhone. Um, this is actually the, the 4, not the 4S. And the thing that's interesting about this is this device is like $800. Um, $800 of computing power in a server farm is just unbelievably more powerful. It, the, 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 the difference in power between my cell phone and $800 in a server farm is, is astronomical. And this is, you know, um, why would we, when we have these really powerful communications channels, why would we possibly constrain what we can do on the device based on the computing power on the device? Because pushing that small um, battery efficient uh, computing power to the device is really expensive yes. comparatively. So what we want to do is we want to use and utilize all of this network infrastructure that we have. And with 4G LTE and like all of these other things coming into play, we're having more and more network capabilities. And nodes really sitting there in the middle facilitating the communication between these high performance things um, on the device, you know, the fancy graphics and all of that, but shuffling the data back and forth between that and the high performance cloud computing. And, you know, using Hadoop and big data to compute, um, you know, using many computers in the cloud cheaply. So that's, that's the kind of the difference where it's like, yes, we want to do amazing things, but it's, we still need this thing in the middle to connect them. Yeah, and that's cool, and you can optimize that, but the question back to Google and Apple, are they standing in the way or is it not really a factor? Um, Android. I, I think it's less of a factor. I think, um, you know, we'd love to see Node on more platforms. I mean, obviously, sort of uh, HP put um, Node into WebOS because they really saw, you know, they really saw a value there. And whatever the success of that product, I think it's inarguable, inarguable from a technical standpoint that it didn't have a significant impact on that product. It didn't yeah. um, add a lot to that product. So I think what would be really interesting to see is, um, you know, uh, whether there's going to be some, yeah. yeah, whether there's going to be some more bets on Node, and certainly um, there are people that are putting Node onto Android devices in, in various different forms. Well, if the developer community continues to get the acceleration that it's getting, I'm sure there's going to be not just pressure, just just social proof to these guys that it's going to work. Um, just to kind of change gears on that thread, I got a, um, a message from one of our younger uh, readers and watchers, uh, entrepreneur, young guy, a coder. He asked the question: Should I learn Rails or should I learn Node? What's what? What should I do? So you got a you know younger generation of um, kind of CS guys and or mm -hmm. coders, not or hackers and CS dudes who who like, hey, I don't mind jumping in and learning four or five different languages, it's a piece of cake. But should I learn learn Ruby first or, or Rails first, or should I learn Node? And I think I mean I would say that uh, I mean obviously sort of at Node Summit we we probably have a bias, but um, one of the things that's really nice about Node is that JavaScript is ubiquitous. If you learn Node, then you're learning JavaScript. And if you know JavaScript, then you have this ability to work both with Node on the server and have this kind of high performance environment that's getting all the press right now um, for good reasons. Um, but then you also have the ability to, to work with that same language and build all these kind of web applications. And I think that's a, that's a really compelling argument for, for so, some of the younger readers is, you know, if you're going to learn something, learn something that's going to be reusable. I think it's going to be interesting to see you know, uh, Ruby and Ruby on Rails, um, how much that proliferates. Like as, you know, uh, if Rails uh, continues to stay popular, then, then, you know, maybe it will, but, you know, is, is uh, Node actually going to be a really tangible threat to, to sort of Ruby on Rails and Ruby is the indie language? You know, as this becomes more popular, um, as Node has made JavaScript a more viable server-side language, you know, that may actually be a really tangible threat. And I mean, to the point where, there are more people on GitHub that, that follow what's happening on Node than do Rails. And that's, the, I mean, that's pretty interesting con considering the, the relative ages of the projects. And you see similar things on Google searches and you know, other things. 
Hey, we're here inside theCUBE. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconAngles.com. We're here with Tom Hughes Crocker with Clint Finley, um, managing editor of now DevOps Angle, our new de dedicated publication to DevOps, which is Node, which is this new emerging greatness around cloud, new architectures. Um, having a fantastic conversation inside theCUBE, our, our flagship telecast where we go out to the events. Um, let's talk about um, your, what you're doing right now. So you wrote a book about Node. Mm -hmm. You're doing a lot of evangelizing and working within the community. Um, what are you up to now for uh, your, uh, your work? So um, I, I spent a long time at Yahoo building really large sort of big websites with lots of users. Um, and it had, I was very lucky that I got to spend some time working at Joint with uh, Ryan Dahl, who created Node. Um, but uh, for me, it was, it was a chance to kind of go out and see what some of the other folks in the industry are doing. So um, I'm currently running a company called Jetpacks for Dinosaurs. Um, and you know, uh, using my experience and, and my colleagues' experience working on very high performance websites and specifically with Node, um, we've been working with some really exciting clients um, that are building some fantastic things with Node, um, solving some really big problems. So um, um, earlier in the week, we've heard from the, the guys at Walmart, um, and Walmart Labs are really pushing the boundaries of what can you do with um, the resources of a large company to really innovate and to really um, take some of those some of those things. So I, I can't you know speak for Walmart, but certainly the things that the Labs team you know are doing are really exciting, um, and I, I, I think. Um, you know, the perspective that I'm seeing is that there are an awful lot of startups um, and existing kind of bigger companies like Walmart that are looking to, um, uh, to really take something like Node and push the boundaries. They're really looking to sort of, you know, if, if I'm a startup, how do I really um, kind of scale my users? How do I build a product that scales fast? And if I'm a big company, um, how do I take um, some part of my application that I have and how do I make it faster and more efficient um, and grow that um, and spend less on resources? Well, let's talk about startups. Okay, so there's a lot of um, young entrepreneurs here. We're here at the Node Jam on day two of Node Summit. So, you know, in the other room in there, they're presenting their, um, their elevator pitches and, and whatnot to the crowd of VCs and, and audience. Um, what's your advice for a startup? I mean, a lot of these guys are, we saw some students some from Brown and, uh, and Notre Dame and some other colleges here. We got some young hackers, um, some CS dudes. What's your advice to startups with playing with Node and around the development and, go, and going to market? Um, I think Node's a really good place to be right now. And I think um, actually a, um, a lot of the, the VCs that are actually kind of looking at it um, are looking for people that are doing Node because they're recognizing that people that are doing Node um, have a technology skill that's going to be very applicable in the future. Um, and um, I think I've, 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 I've even seen now already that um, people that have, have done startups that have used Node, even if the startup hasn't been successful, uh, they as a person have become valuable because there's such um, a demand for skilled node engineers now. So I think there's a, uh, particularly for the younger audience, th there's a real opportunity there because node is becoming the next big thing very rapidly. Um, and, and you know, we've seen from, uh, just from the summit, the, a, a number of large companies um, hiring um, node engineers. Um, so, so there are really great opportunities based on this technology. Um, I think in terms of startups, um, the thing that's really great about node is it's allowing um, startups to kind of pitch out of their out of their league effectively. So typically, you don't have to raise as much money because you know on a couple of servers from either Join or Amazon or whoever, um, you can host a startup that will scale to ten thousand people without trying too hard. You know, with some simple um, technology with Node and, and maybe Mongo or Redis, so like a few things, and you can really start to have that first ten thousand users that's going to help you raise money. Um, without necessarily having to go out there and you know and spend you know your college trust fund or you know um, spend you know the money that you're that you're earning, so there's there's really um, a, a good opportunity now for startups to to be really effective without having to necessarily get too much money. And I think this is kind of this this is a large part of what we're seeing with the uh, the increase in angel funding, the increase of people that are. Um, getting very small seed rounds um, is because they are able to do a lot more without having to go and ask for a million dollars to, to buy a lot of server resources. And also, I would comment on that. I totally agree, by the way. We're totally in the same religion there, and, and it's really great, great for entrepreneurs, and it's great for society. But one thing I'm noticing with Node is that the scale point for success is increased. As you say, pitching out of your league, meaning, you know, when you get a prototype up and running, you get something out there, and then, you know, 
shit hits the fan and starts breaking and you don't have your VC money, you can do more with, with this. Right. So you can actually do a little bit more back-end headroom, if you will, if you think about it properly. Right. Would you agree with that? I, I would absolutely agree with that. And I think this is kind of um, increasingly, I think, what, what you're seeing is that the, the products that people are taking to investors are much more developed. They're much more sophisticated. Um, and I think in general, you know, tools like Node are, are giving people the ability to really like push, push the boundaries of, of what's kind of considered a successful pitch. Are you in the Bay Area? I am in the Bay Area. I'm based okay. in San Francisco. Well, we have uh, one minute left, so we want to uh, wrap up, but I want to just say really enjoyed the conversation. I think we want to do more, talk to you more with our DevOps angle as we get more into this. Um, just on a final word, what's your, what's your feedback to the folks out there around what's the community like around Node? Obviously, uh, we're seeing great tight-knit gum bunch of people, small still, and growing. What's the community like with Node? Um, I would say the Node community has pulled, um, you know, some of the best people from a lot of other communities because they see this as an opportunity to really do things right. Um, and I'm really excited because I've never seen a community grow this fast, um, and I've never seen one that's been quite so respectful. So I feel like the Node community is really embracing. If you're not sure what Node's about, um, try the mailing list, try the chat rooms, um, and you'll find a place where people will openly welcome you um, and really help you get started. I think I would add. Uh Respectful is a great word. I would also add professional. Right. There's a lot of professional and range of, it's not just one class of, of, of folk, if you will. Right. Uh, so uh, the Node community is uh, uh, respectful, professional, great stuff. Uh, Thomas wrote, Tom wrote the book. Thank you so much for being on theCUBE. Appreciate Thanks it. A lot. All right, we're going to take a quick break.